The trial of billionaire businessman Jimmy Lai Chi Ying starts in Hong Kong this week. It's scheduled to last 83 days. Now there are lots of Western mainstream media reports about this and every single one I have read rigidly follows the standard Pentagon narrative. The commies who took over Hong Kong have locked up Jimmy Lai, a noble saintly soldier for democracy, freedom and human rights, USA, USA. In contrast, people in Hong Kong who have actually read his publications say he's a deeply illiberal Trump fanatic billionaire who brought pornography into mainstream media. So not quite a saint then. But whether you take the Western view or the Hong Kong view, one thing is for sure. There's a deep connection between Jimmy Lai and the United States of America. And it's been there for a while. Let me give you a quick history lesson. The British Crown Colony of Hong Kong was an interesting place in 1994-95 with all sorts of new organisations springing up. With encouragement and in some cases clear financial support from the United States. I'll just mention three. There's a new group called the Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions which popped into existence and is shown in US records as regularly receiving large amounts of cash from that CIA spin-off group, the NED. Furthermore, a new NGO called the Hong Kong Human Rights Monitor, also with funding from the NED, appeared in the city. And the Apple Daily was launched, financial backing unknown. I attended a pre-launch gathering to mark the arrival of the paper at the luxury Hong Kong Parkview home of a man named L. Gordon Krovitz, very nice guy with an equally nice wife. Now, Apple Daily, when it appeared, was like a cruder version of the UK's News of the World, a newspaper I actually worked for very briefly. Apple sprinkled its attacks on China with scandal, gossip and outright pornography, and it was regularly sued for defamation. In a 1995 interview in the South China Morning Post, Jimmy Lai said, Our porn page is not very well done, but we have to have it because man has basic needs. You get the picture, right? Now the years went by and these three groups and other pro-American groups became known for their fierce criticism of China, especially in terms of labor rights. Which is ironic since the International Labor Organization rates China higher than the USA on that topic. That's an inconvenient fact no one ever mentions. One day I took a look at the list of non-executive directors of Jimmy Lai's publishing company, which had become known as Next Digital. I knew all three of these Apple Daily guys personally. This is the aforementioned Gordon Krovitz. He now runs a US company called NewsGuard, which works as a global arbiter of truth. It tells the world which news outlets worldwide can be trusted and which are unreliable. As you can imagine, NewsGuard gets regularly sued by news outlets, which complain that what it really does is tell the world which media groups follow the US government narrative. Interestingly, NewsGuard signed a contract for 749,387 US dollars with the Pentagon. They got the cash to identify unwanted narratives and various other forms of foreign influence. Ooh. Incidentally, in this region, NewsGuard has given its blessing to Hong Kong Free Press, which will come as a great surprise to absolutely no one. Remember Brian Kern, the American guy from the Hong Kong Free Press who pretended to be a, a locally born Hong Kong Chinese person uh, and who was a, a quoted as such by all the big media around the world? Well, after he was exposed as a white guy in yellow face, he went back to America. In fact, I believe his wife works with Mrs. Gordon Krovitz these days. Hey guys, what does Mrs. Krovitz do? Well, she's an interesting character. Her name is Minky Warden and she worked very hard uh, to campaign against the Beijing Winter Olympics. Mm, that campaign was not very successful. The, the, the games went on and uh, they went rather successfully. These days, as I say, NewsGuard is getting lots of lawsuits because the US narrative is um, showing a few cracks, shall we say. Now this guy is Mark Clifford, who wrote a book, I kid you not, called Today Hong Kong, tomorrow the world. What China's crackdown reveals about its plan to end freedom everywhere. <laughs> yeah, right, I know, right? 
I did not make that up. That's the title of the book. Mark, 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 Mark. You know, Hong Kong is statistically the healthiest city in the world. And it's a low crime place, despite there being more billionaires per square meter here than in any other city on the planet. So it's healthy and wealthy and safe. I don't think China wants to introduce its governance system anywhere else. It doesn't even insist on having it in its own country. China's full of special zones trying out different systems. Anyway, Mark is terrified that China will take over the world and make it more like Hong Kong. Make it healthy and wealthy and safe, right? Oh, how terrible. <laughs> Now this guy is Mark Simon, who used to work for US Naval Intelligence and then became the number two at Apple Daily. And that seems to have a full-time job, bad-mouthing Hong Kong. Hi Mark. You always tell me you love this place, but now you seem devoted to like slapping us down. Can't work it out. On that note, it's interesting to note that for, for years, the Apple Daily called for international sanctions on Hong Kong. Sanctions that would harm our economy, harm our society, harm our reputation, harm the livelihoods of people at all levels. Now the world's public is being told by the Western press that Apple Daily was the only pro-democracy paper in Hong Kong. But you never see that description from media in Hong Kong. People here prefer to describe it as an anti-China newspaper or anti-government publication. Important distinction. So who's right? People in the West or people here? Well, you can decide. The authorities in Hong Kong spent more than 10 years drawing up a new body of legislation to pass uh, from 2013 onwards, which would introduce democratic elections for our chief executive. Yes, actual universal suffrage in so many words. Now, bizarrely, Apple Daily campaigned against it on the basis that they didn't like the electoral college element, which would vet candidates despite the fact that many places had the same system, and the Hong Kong public definitely supported the government plan. Why did Apple not want democracy in Hong Kong? Some academics said Apple Daily didn't want it because it would show that one country, two systems actually works. It still works. That would not make America happy. You see, if one country, two systems worked in Hong Kong, it would also work in Taiwan, right? A place that legally belongs to mainland China but which America uh, sees as a political tool to use for its own purposes. Now, here's an observation that many people have shared. During the 2019 insurrection in Hong Kong, Apple Daily gave the biggest encouragement to the aimlessly violent people who had no plan other than to destroy Hong Kong's economy, close the airport and shut down our public transport system. There's no conceivable way that the endless parade of destruction of public facilities would lead to more democracy. As Hong Kong people on all sides of the debate said repeatedly, the process Apple Daily was encouraging could have no possible outcome except to taunt Beijing to intervene, which of course was the whole point. It was as if Apple Daily was not serving the Hong Kong people but serving the United States by destroying the successful one country, two systems policy. Now, Jimmy Lai's relationship with the US government has always been fascinating, but it became clear to me by about 2020 that he'd come to like only one side of the US political family, the Republicans. Biden is useless, he wrote in one of his publications. Trump is a statesman. Jimmy Lai opened a Twitter account on the 22nd of May 2020 and spent the first day sounding like a, a rather rednecked Republican. He criticized the CCP and praised Donald Trump, describing him as the the most powerful leader in the world. He then launched a hashtag Trump saves Hong Kong campaign on the front page of his newspaper. The idea was to invite Trump to come, take over Hong Kong and sort out his problems. I wouldn't trust Trump to sort out my sock drawer. Now coming almost back to date, there's an even more revealing connection between Jimmy Lai's publishing group and the US political classes. In 2020, Apple Daily had become so entangled with the Republican right that it secretly dug into its coffers to pay journalists to collect all the damaging rumors about Hunter Biden's dealings with Chinese companies and issue a report about them. Now this report was published as if it had been written by an independent journalist called Martin Aspen, who looked like this. 
and it was sent to the media who printed articles about it before the 2020 Trump versus Biden US election. But the truth slipped out that Martin Aspen was a computer generated character and the report was actually financed by Apple Daily. It was all very embarrassing for everyone concerned, especially Jimmy Lai and Mark Simon, um, who apologized. The funny thing, of course, was that Apple Daily was now shown to be not only interfering with Hong Kong politics, but interfering in US politics, upcoming US elections, no less. I mean, can you see the irony there? I just had a thought. It's very, very illegal for a foreign body to interfere with US elections, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So why wasn't there a lawsuit? That would have been interesting, wouldn't it? The US suing Apple Daily. But we all know that that would never happen because Apple Daily served the US. Now, some people from the US have said the legal proceedings in Hong Kong should be described as a show trial. But the truth is that international legal indexes rate the Hong Kong legal system higher than that of many countries in the West, including the United States. The really interesting thing is that the, the charges are not just against him. Some are against him and other anti-China activists, while other charges are against him and senior staff from his publishing company. Now, all the others have pleaded guilty, the activists and the publishing folk. All have acknowledged the truth of the facts as presented by the prosecution. Now, it's very hard to win a case when the people with you have stood up in court and said, yep, that's what's happened. That's what we did. Yes, those are the facts, my lad. As the prosecution says, those are the facts. What exactly did they own up to doing in those earlier cases? That's really interesting, but it'll take a while to explain. So I'll tell you all about that in a separate report. Peace.